Department of Nutritional, I'll start again. Welcome to the Department of Nutritional Sciences Bodette Thompson Lectureship. Um, very excited to, to see everybody here today. Um, we, we have a, a very exciting uh, speaker today. And uh, before we get to introducing her, I want to hand over to um, our Dean, uh, Laura Lawson, for some opening remarks. Well, thank you, Josh. And um, thank you all for inviting me to give the welcoming remarks to the 30th annual Baudet Thompson Lecture. Uh, again, my name is Laura Lawson. I'm Interim Executive Dean for the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. Um, so in this role, um, I've had a great opportunity to learn a lot about the school and each department at SEBS has wonderful traditions, um, such as this lecture series that shape the character of, of the community. Preparing for this welcome provided a chance for me to learn about a new aspect of our school's history. I had the opportunity to learn about two faculty members, uh, Dr. Willard Thompson, professor and head of poultry when we were the College of Agriculture, and Dr. Fred Baudet, um, a veterinarian in the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. They worked together to develop vaccines to protect poultry from Newcastle disease and laryngotracheitis, which I've never had to say that word out loud before. Um, these men uh, who joined our faculty in the early 1920s left their lasting impact through their students and research, the naming of one of our beloved campus buildings, Thompson Hall, and also through their family and friends endowment that supports this lecture series. Even before being asked to give this welcome, I had noted this lecture as one I really had to attend. Um, the questions posed by Dr. Fanzo's lecture title, can we have it all, considering the trade-offs in achieving both human and planetary health, resonates um, with our, the very purpose of our school. In the recent 19, or sorry, in the recent 2020 strategic plan, the vision we set forth for the school is a healthy and sustainable future that balances the well-being of all living organisms with the health of the earth. We recognize that we face existential challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, food insecurity, human population growth, resource inequities, and racial, social, and environmental injustices. These challenges are not abstract, um, ab abstractly into the future. They are very present now and only getting worse um, unless we develop solutions and practices that, that attend to both the needs of communities and the environment. Today's students, tomorrow's leaders in academia, industry, and government need to understand the complex problems that require many perspectives to understand in order to develop solutions, both small and big, one time and perpetual, and largely systematic, that will touch on every facet of life and impact the health of both our nearby, of, of our communities and our planetary environment. We're talking about changes um, to systems through new knowledge and consequent policies and practices. So this is no small task. Dr. Afonso's lecture today addresses these issues and focuses on food systems, the need to produce enough food, healthy food, culturally appropriate food, and not lead to environmental degradation. She calls for changing systems and bold policies. And I look forward to her talk. I thank Dr. Jessica Franzo, Fanzo for coming today. Um, to share your, your research and your perspective. And I also wanna thank um, Dr. Josh Miller and the Nutritional Sciences faculty for sharing this lecture with our larger community. And I just uh, welcome everyone and I look forward to the talk. So thank you very much. And you're muted, Josh. I was trying not to make that mistake. Um, so uh, thank you, um, uh, Dean Lawson, for those wonderful words. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jessica Fanzo as our 2021 Bodette Thompson Lectureship Speaker. Dr. Fanzo is the Interim Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs and International Research Cooperation at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Fanzo also directs the Hopkins Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and serves as Food and Nutrition Security Director at the Hopkins Alliance for Health A Healthier World. Dr. Fanzo comes to us with over 20 years of research and program experience in the field in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
South and East Asia, and the United States. Her area of expertise is the impact of transitioning food systems on healthy, environmentally sustainable diets, and more broadly on the livelihoods of people living in resource constrained places. Upon this background and experience, Dr. Fanzo has held various prestigious positions in international programs, including in 2012 as the first laureate of the Carasso Foundation's Sustainable Diets Prize, and 2017 to 2019 as co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report and the United Nations High-Level Panel of Experts on Food Systems and Nutrition. She's also served as advisor for a variety of um, organizations, including the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, uh, uh, that's the GAIN program, International Food Policy Research Institute, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, the UN Standing Committee on Nutrition, United States Agency for International Development, USAID, the World Bank, and the WHO. Based on her experience and expertise, I can think of no one better to speak to us today about how we maintain both human and planetary health in these early days of the Anthropocene. Please welcome Dr. Jessica Fanzo. Great, thank you so much, uh, Josh, for inviting me and Dean Lawson for your great opening words and also Christina Duffy for helping arrange this whole uh, meeting. It is, is a real pleasure to, to be here at Rutgers. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, and it's a really time, timely talk in the sense that we're in the middle of the COP. The COP26 climate change meetings are going on right now. I was uh, on another panel earlier with the New York Times and it's a very uh, important moment for the world, a uh, very decisive moment for the world and how we move forward. And of course, food and nutrition sits central to that. And that is what my talk will be about. So I'll share my screen. As she's uh, sharing her screen, I just want to tell people, if you have questions, please put them into the chat, and we will uh, raise them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Great. Okay, so, so can we have it all? Can we, can we have both human and planetary health? And what are some of the trade-offs and ethical conundrums that we face uh, to have both human and planetary health. So first, I'm just going to talk about food systems and how they are both instigators and victims of climate change and, and walk you through a bit of that data. And of course, what are the impacts of climate change on diets and food security? What are we, what are we facing with, with climate disruption? And what are some of the ethical challenges that we face if we want to improve and transform food systems? And with those ethical challenges, what are some of the trade-offs that we're facing? And, and what trade-offs are we willing to live with? And can we have it all? And I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully end on a, a positive note. So food systems being both victims and instigators of climate change. Well, I think many of you know, I, I certainly hope you all know at this point that we are in the middle of catastrophic climate breakdown. Uh, we are living in the Anthropocene, which is Earth's most recent geological time period. And it's defined as being a time period that is significantly impacted by humans. And what we're seeing is overwhelming evidence of earth system trend changes. So here on the top, you'll see um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, all increasing over the last century. But we also see other environmental degradations, increasing ocean acidification, uh, decreasing uh, forest loss or deforestation, biosphere degradation, uh, collapsing of, of, of fisheries, you name it, the earth is very constrained. And, and when you look at these trends over time, what you see is the rapid pace of increase in the last decade or two, which is incredibly alarming to see the significant 
race, racing pace of change. And of course, much of that has to do with the way we are living our lives. Our populations are exponentially increasing. Many people are moving to urban places using a lot of energy, using a lot of water, using transportation that is often fed by, by fossil fuels. Um, the entire way we are living our lives is having a profound impact on the climate and the environment. So we are in the middle of human-induced climate change. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that comes out every five years, I think many of you probably saw that report a few weeks ago, showed that not only is uh, the, the, the world warming at a significant rate, as you can see here, but a lot of that is due, again, to human and natural events over time. And we're also looking at how food will change. So <clears throat> this is showing you a three degree warmer and a scarier world. Let's hope we never get to three degrees. And when looking at crop yields or the amount of crops produced um, across the world in this warmer world where we've taken no action on climate change, essentially, you'll see that across much of the Southern uh, parts of, of the world, crop yields will decline. Now, in some Northern territories, you'll see bumper crops, but that's less so. And so if you live in Canada or Russia, you'll be, you'll be in luck. But for most of the world, much of, of, of the crop yields will be constrained. And a lot of that's due to water stress, either uh, significant droughts or extreme flooding. And that of course will decimate crops. And this is showing you water stress in many agriculture areas by 2025, um, stress will increase. Uh, in a business as usual climate scenario. Um, and so you can see in the reds is where there will be higher stress uh, um, in very productive areas of the planet. Look at the United States, the, the Midwestern Corn Belt states, you'll see significant stress of water and they're already feeling that in places like Nebraska and other areas where they're producing a lot of crops. We also know that uh, biodiversity uh, will be significantly threatened and is already, which has significant impacts on agriculture and what we can grow, the, the variety of crops we can grow. This is showing you business as usual, no action taken. You can see these red uh, shades across the world with significant biodiversity threats and extinction. And in a more uh, climate-friendly scenario in which the world has taken action um, to address climate, you see uh, still threats, but the much less significant as far as biodiversity loss and extinction. And what we're dealing with is these multiple breadbasket failures. Many modelers who are doing crop modeling with climate change are suggesting that in the next decade, we could see co-occurring uh, uh, major crop failures of major crop commodities like wheat, maize, soybean, and rice due to extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, flooding, cold spells. And this will likely happen at the same time putting roughly 2 billion people at risk for food insecurity. So these multiple breadbasket failures have been shown over and over and over again by policy at the policymakers, but there's still very little action being taken to deal with those extreme weather events. We also know that the nutritional quality of crops is significantly altered by increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in this case, CO2, what they call a CO2 fertilization effect. And this is some interesting work um, by colleagues in the Lancet Planetary Health showing that across the world with more CO2, 
there'll be uh, significant impacts on the quality of a variety of crops with roughly 20% declines in protein, 14% declines, 14, 15% declines in iron and zinc, two nutrients that are already uh, significantly deficient in many parts of the world. And we know that food systems are already vulnerable to shocks. If you have an extreme weather event, it could shock a crop, wiping out that crop, causing people to move and migrate. And that of course puts political stress, social upheaval um, on other populations as well as the populations that are migrating or things like uh, monocropping systems that you see in the United States with a pathogen wiping out that crop, potentially impacting um, the availability of nutrients for a large swath of the population. There's so many of these different types of shocks and obviously climate will exacerbate uh, the ability for food systems to respond and bounce back to some of these shocks. Well, food systems are very complex and I'm showing you this diagram which shows the different components of food systems here in these three middle boxes and it shows food supply chains, food is produced, it's stored, it's processed, it's packaged, and it moves to markets. Consumers, individuals bring with themselves their own factors, income, purchasing power, their information and knowledge, their desires and aspirations. They bring those factors to markets or what is also called food environments when they're making decisions about what to purchase or buy. These food environments also have many different attributes. What kind of food is available? Is the food affordable? What are the product properties? What are the vendor properties? What kind of advertising and marketing is in the food environment? Um, where is the food in the store? All of these different factors are influencing diets, and the variety of outcomes that we want food systems to bring, be they environment outcomes, nutrition and health outcomes, economic outcomes, and social equity and inclusion outcomes. And food systems are also being shaped by different drivers, be they population pressure, urbanization, migration, globalization, and trade. And these drivers are influencing the directionality of food systems in positive and negative ways. So why am I showing you this graph? Well, food systems are incredibly complex. There's many components, many different types of actors. Food systems work across multiple scales from very global to very local. And these systems are impacting climate change the way we produce our food, the way we move food, the packaging we use, the waste at the household and individual level, all of that is influencing climate change. And what is estimated is that food systems contribute about 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. That's a lot. So it's not only agriculture production, but it's land use change, predominantly deforestation, um, slash and burn agriculture, the way we, we package food, transport it, lose food, all of these different elements are contributing to greenhouse gases. Now, one of the big contributors is methane coming from cattle's digestion or enteric fermentation of, of cows that are, are, are burping uh, a methane, which is a type of greenhouse gas but we're getting emissions from other places too, fertilizers, nitrous oxide, methane from rice, methane from manure management, fuel use in fisheries and, and, and more of the, um, the uh, seabed trawling fisheries. So we're seeing many different aspects of food systems and all of their complexity that are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and also environmental degradation. When we look at food production, so this is agriculture systems producing different types of food, 
they induce different environmental stresses. This is some work we did a couple of years ago now led by Marco Springman showing that animal products here in red now present day in 2010 and the second bar is in a business as usual take no action on climate change by 2050 you see that animal products produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions but when you look across the portfolio of land use change mainly deforestation water use and nitrogen and phosphorus application being basically nutrient runoff into water and coastal ways, you see that food groups have different contributions to environmental stresses now and into the future with staple grains in blue here at the bottom, contributing a lot of stress, fruits and vegetables having significant water footprints. So depending on the life cycle of the food, how it's grown, where it's grown, and by whom can have different environmental stresses. It's not just that cows are the only bad guys. There's lots of different ways to emit greenhouse gases from different foods, but cows are a significant emitter of greenhouse gases. And one thing to note, uh, these staple grains, about half of them are going to feed animals that we then consume. So the animal conundrum is, is significant. So what, what are the impacts of climate on food systems and diets? Well, if you look at climate change uh, in the business as usual, again, taking no action shown here in red, we'll see that a significant number of people will be at risk of hunger out into 2050. And we also see that the dietary energy available in kcals per person per day will decline in the business as usual. Now, if we take action on climate change shown in blue and green in different scenarios, you could really stop this from happening. But of course, we need action taken on climate change. We'll talk about that. What we're left with beyond just uh, the risk of hunger is that we currently have 111, or sorry, 811 million people who are undernourished or go to bed hungry every night. That's about 10% of the world's population. That number's been increasing for the last four years in a row, due mainly to climate, conflict, and now COVID, the three Cs. We have 149 million children under the age of five who are stunted or chronically undernourished. That may, may not seem like a lot, but that's about 22% of the world's children under the age of five who will never reach their full potential. They are chronically undernourished, which has detrimental impacts into their adulthood. We have 45 million children who are wasted or acutely malnourished. These children are at very high risk of dying. This number has essentially not changed in over a decade. 39 million children under the age of five who are overweight, unheard of 20 years ago. And 2.1 billion adults who are overweight and obese. And that has significant impacts on risk of non-communicable diseases. And what we're seeing at is that in many countries, they're dealing with double burdens of these, both undernutrition and overweight and obesity. And you see that in many low and middle income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, South Asia into East Asia, we're seeing these double, sometimes triple burdens of malnutrition which makes it incredibly hard for governments to address when you have such complex burdens happening at the same time. So how did we get to this place where the food systems are, are contributing, one, not enough food for some people. This is a family in Chad in a refugee camp, you know, obviously reliant here, you see the World Food, uh, World food Program bottle of water living on very little throughout a week. And this is a family here in North Carolina. Look at all of the food they have, but it's not necessarily healthy food, mainly highly processed or what's called ultra processed foods. Isn't this incredible how the food system, our global food system has created these, this, these two polar opposite situations. And why is that? Why has this happened? A lot of it has to do with governance. We also know that diets are a con 
considerable risk factor of disease and death, considered one of the top risk factors now of morbidity and mortality with 11 million deaths per year attributable to dietary risk factors. Things like diets high in sodium, diets low in whole grains, fruits, nuts and seeds and vegetables. These type of diets, very high in processed foods, which you don't see here, are killing people. And it's incredible. It surpasses tobacco use, it surpasses air pollution, also a climate change issue, um, alcohol use and many other risk factors related to disease and death. And what we know is that it is really hard to eat healthy. It's hard because about 3 billion people on the planet cannot afford a healthy, protective, nutrient adequate diet. And you see in places like Sub-Saharan Africa in the brown, dark brown, South Asia, into Indonesia, you see um, 75 to 100% of the population cannot afford a healthy diet. And that plays out in the COVID context. We saw that people who could not get access to healthy food, they could not afford healthy food, also could not afford health care, couldn't exercise, contributed to obesity, which became a significant risk factor for COVID. And the way this played out was many populations due to racial ethnic discrimination, we saw who fared worse with COVID. And a lot of that had to do with the color of your skin, uh, where you live, your caste, your tribe. Um, and we're seeing these significant inequities play out and the food systems have highlighted, hijacked and highlighted these inequities that are showing through now in times of COVID. And we know that outside of the food system, we have significant systemic issues around racism, social injustices that need to be dealt with outside the food system, but that impact every system and the ability for populations to um, be productive citizens and to fulfill their, their dreams and goals. And we also know that zoonotic diseases are rising. We are in the middle of a pandemic. I think all of you know that. <laughs> and COVID-19 is likely a zoonotic disease due to a spillover event that jumped from animals to humans. When we think about zoonotic diseases, what's interesting is that 60% of emerging infectious diseases are from animals or zoonotic. And of that 60%, 70% originate in wildlife. Well, why am, why am I talking about this? Well, food and agriculture play a big part in the rise of zoonotic spillover events. Because the way we are growing our food, we are destroying natural habitats where wildlife live. We're forcing animals to be put in closer proximity to humans because we are destroying or shrinking their natural habitats. And we're moving them in closer proximities to not only us, but domesticated animals, increasing the risk of spillover events. And some good work by uh, some colleagues showed that we can see that this is a heat map showing you the spatial patterns of emerging zoonotic infectious diseases of wildlife origin. You really see that play out, particularly in Asia, um, where there's significant risk of future spillover events. The other issue we'll have to contend with are food prices. In different climate change scenarios, we will see food prices rise. This is showing you um, food price uh, increases, SP, SSP1 is a scenario, SSP3 is another scenario. I'm showing you um, SSP is really no action taken on climate. Food prices will rise and most of that will be staple crops, which the poor, often prioritize, particularly in times of stress. And we know that uh, increased food prices can lead to social unrest. This is showing you in blue, the food price index. And in 2008, 2009, the first significant food price crisis, you can see the increased curve in 2011, uh, we saw a lot of food related protests and riots shown in green. So, you know, 
where there's hunger, there's social unrest. And this can create significant conflict and migration issues. We're already seeing climate migrators, people moving away from farming, moving out of harm's way, moving north, moving, uh, you know, moving west to, to try to make ends meet. And this will continue um, with climate change and, and with little action being taken. So what are some of the ethical challenges uh, that we face to transform food systems? So what do I mean by transformation? Well, the UN Food System Summit just happened and their idea of an idealized food system transformation is one that of course ensures availability, access and affordability of sufficient, nutritious, safe diets for everyone. That those diets are produced from sustainable and resilient food systems that benefit nature and that promote fair and equitable livelihoods. About 4 billion people work in the food system, either formally or informally. But when you ask people, what do they want from their food system? People will give you different answers. And they'll say, community, resilience, reciprocity, um, community empowerment, love, <laughs> all kinds of different goals people have for their food system. So how do we, how do we ensure that everyone is satisfied? And that is the big issue that, that we need to contend with. And when we think about transformation, I hope I convinced you in the previous slides, we need big changes. We need radical transformation of the food system and significant action taken by governments. This tinkering on the edges and doing little nudges is not gonna be sufficient of where we are in the world right now. So one big ethical dilemma is who suffers the consequences of the world's dietary choices. We know that in some parts of the world, like the United States, our diets are, are quite energy intensive as are our lifestyles. And poor populations are likely to be disproportionately affected by those lifestyles that the wealthy have. So how do we deal with that? Well, the Eat Lancet Commission that I was a part of showed that there's significant inequities in diets. And what they did was they came up with a planetary diet that was a very plant-based diet that not only would protect human health, but would protect the planet. And when they looked at what the world consumed, look, the boundary here in orange is the planetary diet. And you can see in the world, we eat way too much red meat and way too many starchy staples. Here's North America. We consume a lot of red meat, starchy staples, eggs, chicken, dairy, and not enough of the fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. We're way below the boundary for that. Here's South Asia, a lot of starchy staples, not enough of the good stuff. And here's Sub-Saharan Africa, same situation. Not enough good stuff, a lot of starchy staples. What this to me shows is the incredible inequities between diets if you just look regionally. And if you look household-wise, you'd see that even more. So why are we consuming so many animal source foods, very energy, very environmentally intensive compared to South Asia? And is that fair? Is that fair to do? And so who needs to make those changes to their diets? Well, here's the United States looking at animal source foods, look how much we consume compared to places like Cambodia, Senegal, Ethiopia, that probably don't get enough animal source foods as compared to for their, for their health needs and their nutritional needs, but especially compared to even the Eat Lancet, a very planet-friendly, plant-based diet. You see in some places, they just aren't getting enough animal source foods to meet their micronutrient needs. But the United States, United Kingdom, Brazil, we, we consume way too much. So those are the countries that probably need to make larger changes. But we know that meat consumption increases as GDP increases. Um, this is classic Bennett's law, an ag econ law that shows that as people get wealthier, they tend to diversify their diet. Um, and this is just this classic pattern you see. So the demand for meat is rising. So how do we deal with that? Another ethical implication is 
is it is it the right decision to raise meat when we still have 811 million people who go to bed hungry? Is that the best use of natural resources? Is it the best use of cereals to feed these animals? Is it the best use of energy and water? If you look at um, the energy, water and feed to produce a pound of protein of, of cows versus chickens or a kilogram of meat, uh, uh, of uh, red meat versus chickens, you see that cows are incredibly energy, water, and feed intensive. So is it the best use to use land to grow cereals to feed animals that we then consume? Well, that's a big question because if we think about our land, a habitable land, 50% of that land is being used to grow agriculture. But of that, 77% is taken up by livestock for meat and dairy, but it's only 18% of our global calorie supply and only 37% of our protein supply. So significant uh, use of land, a lot of that from deforested land um, and not producing a whole lot of calories for the world. And here you can see Deforestation, what's the main driver? Beef. Beef is the biggest driver of deforestation around the world. And if any of you are following the COP, you have heard that countries have now committed to trying to end deforestation by 2030. I'm not sure if all the countries signed up. I'd be curious to know if Brazil signed on to that. Um, but you know, beef is the biggest contributor to deforestation, which is... Um, incredibly devastating for, for climate change. Now, what if the world were to eat that Eat Lancet Commission diet, that planet diet that uh, is protective for human health and stays within the planetary boundaries? This yellow graph is showing you no one eating the Eat Lancet, everyone continuing to eat the diet they eat and wasting food. This is what our food production systems look like, our agriculture systems. Now, if the world were to eat the Eat Lancet diet shown in green, and we cut food waste in half, the green bars show you what the agriculture systems would look like. And there'd be, have to be significant changes to the agriculture system. No increase in cereal production. Our entire agriculture system is mainly made up of cereals, about 75% of the land were growing cereals. Vegetables, fruits would need to increase significantly. Fish, increasing 50%. We're running out of wild fish, so we'd have to, this would have to come from aquaculture. Legumes and nuts, 75, 150%. And livestock would have to come down 65%. So this is a threat to the livestock sector in a significant way. And we know that some populations really depend on livestock, but they are very stressed and constrained. This is some work done uh, by Dr. Elizabeth Fox, looking at pastoralist communities um, in Northern Kenya. And she's been looking at how they uh, are coping with some of these constraints around climate change. And they're some of the most marginalized populations in the world, but these dryland pastoralist areas are critically important because this is where a lot of terrorist cells grow, are grown out of and they recruit failed pastoralists or, pet, or young men who leave pastoralism because it's just too difficult to, to survive in these kind of environments. Another ethical consideration is what options are ethically permissible, acceptable and affordable? Would the world wanna eat lab-grown meat Will the world want to eat insects or plant-based proteins? These new, these new high-tech plant-based uh, foods that some are worried about the high processing of these foods. Are these going to be acceptable to a lot of consumers? That's a big question. Some other work done by Elizabeth Fox and Shauna Downs, Professor Shauna Downs at Rutgers. Um, uh, we worked on a paper looking at how U.S. consumers sort foods, and they were given a, a whole list of foods and asked just to sort them in any way that they thought made sense. And naturally, they would sort foods around the typical food groups. 
But it's interesting to see what were the outliers when they did sorting. Things like plant-based milks, <laughs> instant ramen noodles. <laughs> what are those exactly? Impossible burger, in vitro meat burger. It's interesting to see how US consumers, as were consumers in uh, Nebraska and California, didn't really find a place for some of these new alt protein foods. And what about blue foods? This was a blue foods assessment that we've been involved with over the last few years, looking at how can we ensure that aquatic foods become more of a mainstay? You know, they can have really important benefits for not only this is nutrition, this is, uh, sorry, this is showing you the, uh, the, the percent contribution of 100 grams of, of the daily recommended requirement for zinc, sorry, that's cut off. And um, this is showing you greenhouse gas emissions. There's some seafoods that are really uh, incredible, like bivalves, mussels, clams, oysters, my favorite, very high amounts of zinc, very low greenhouse gas carb, uh, emissions. So we need to start thinking about these blue foods, which any poor populations rely on in places like Bangladesh and Cambodia and other parts of the world. How do we ensure that these blue foods are sustainable and an important part of the diet moving forward? And my last ethical issue is how do we shift the balance of power? Who shapes and governs food systems? When we look at supply chains of food, we've got 1.5 billion producers and 8 billion eaters. But when we look across the middle part of the value chain, we see this significant consolidation and concentration of transnational food and beverage corporations. And they're not always having the best interests of environment and public health in mind. Profit is king. So how do we deal with this significant power imbalance of some of these uh, companies who are essentially controlling the entire agri-food supply chain. So just quickly on trade-offs, I think um, you know, we're, uh, we have a lot of lessons that we can learn. Um, we had the green revolution that increased cereal production but did not really impact land use change. But there's been a lot of trade-offs with the green revolution and we've seen so many different historic lessons of where we've got trade-offs and synergies. One thing that we've been working on is looking at sustainability of food systems. And this is work led by Chris Bene to try to understand what, uh, what is driving trade-offs in food systems towards more or less sustainability. And when we look at um, countries uh, where this is low-income countries, where we try to improve food and nutrition outcomes, economic outcomes also improve. So this is a very synergistic. But in high income countries, um, when you see economic growth, you see declines in nutrition outcomes. So there's a real trade off there as high income countries continue to generate income, we're seeing detriment to nutrition outcomes. So we need to start thinking about trade offs. Another thing that we did was looking at some of the technologies in food systems, digital agriculture, gene technology, personalized health. And we looked across the sustainable development goals um, to see what was synergistic and what had potential trade-offs shown in blue and red respectively. So personalized health may have a, an impact, a positive impact on zeroing hunger, for example, but it had a, uh, basically a null effect on poverty, had a, a trade-off on inequity. Not everyone gets access to personalized health. So we have to be thinking about both synergies and trade-offs of innovations or actions that we choose to take across food systems. And this is just showing you one of these innovations, personalized nutrition, and mapping out some of the positive and negative implications across the sustainable development goals. So there's lots of new tools out there to try to look at sustainability of food systems and trying to understand the trade-offs that come with them. So can we have it all? 
can we have both human and planetary health? Well, my short answer is it depends. <laughs> we really have to focus on the harder stuff. And I didn't go too much into that in this, in this talk, but we have a really fractured political environment when it comes time to food systems. And we saw that in the UN Food Systems Summit. We need to have better governance of food systems. We need governments to care about their food systems um, and shepherd them in the right directions. We need more investment, investment in the right places. Maybe some of you saw the debate on Twitter with David Beasley, the head of World Food Program, asking Elon Musk for $6 billion to end hunger. And it turned into a big fight on Twitter um, with Elon Musk asking what, how WFP spends their money and to be transparent. But there's clearly need to invest in food systems. The question is in what and how and at what scale. We need to develop human capacity. A lot of people that are working in countries find food systems, thinking about them holistically, very complex and hard to sink your teeth into. We need to cultivate movements, coalitions, and networks. Why don't we have a youth movement on food systems like we do climate change? Why, why is that not top of the agenda for, for the next generation? We need to champion rights and equity. Too many inequities showing through. COVID has shown that, as I talked about earlier. Balancing some of those power asymmetries. Mitigating conflicts of interest. Nutrition is ripe with them, as we know. And we need to consider incentives. What incentives will elicit people to make changes, whether it's a farmer, it's a consumer, or private sector? <clears throat> I'll end with these seven points <clears throat> of what I think we need to do. What one thing is for certain is that a business at, um, as usual approach to food systems is not sufficient to meet the Paris climate change targets. If we want to stay below 1.5 degree, we need to do several things. We need to increase yields. We need to cut food waste in half. We need to eat healthier calories, plant-rich diets, and institute <clears throat> more sustainable food system practices. We have to do all of this to stay below 1.5. If we take no action on food systems, and we only address transportation and energy, which is what most of the COP26 is talking about, they won't meet the Paris climate change targets. We need to be thinking about food. We have political momentum. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, we just had the UN Food System Summit. A lot of countries were there, they were present, they were making commitments. We now need to track those commitments. So we have Political momentum, food is very high on the agenda at the moment. We need to sustain that momentum. Part of that is informing policymakers about evidence and data that we have in hand. We have more knowledge than we've ever had before, but we need to put data in the hands of policymakers and sit at the table that they have set, not the ones we want them to sit at. What kind of data do they need to make better decisions? We've developed something called the Food Systems Dashboard that pulls together lots of data in a very visually appealing way to help decision makers in making the right decisions. We also started a new project, it's a monitoring project, to monitor food systems performance over the next decade to 2030, when the Sustainable Development Goals end, and really provide a countdown on how food systems can be improved and we've developed this architecture. I, I won't go into it too much. I can answer questions where we have five working groups, three on the outcomes of food systems on diets, nutrition, and health, environment and climate, livelihoods, poverty, and equity, and two cross-cutting issues on governance, resilience, and sustainability. So this group is going to be tracking the highest quality indicators that we have available to us and potentially developing new indicators to measure how food systems are transforming in real time. 
We have so many food system innovations to mitigate and adapt to climate change. This is some work done by Cynthia Rosenswig and colleagues at Columbia University and others showing all of these different innovations, whether it be tillage and crop establishment, uh, you know, feed and fodder banks, food storage infrastructure to reduce loss, uh, reducing food waste, packaging, plastic reductions. All of these have potential to not only improve human health, improve the environment, but also to adapt and mitigate against climate change. We just need these inventions, innovations, technologies, and, and uh, interventions invested in and scaled up. We also need to be thinking about consumer demand. What incentivizes people to change their diets? Is it the environment? Is it health? Probably not. I mean, Shauna Downs, who's on the call, she, hopefully, she, um, she's done a lot of work looking at what motivates a dietary choice. And we know that taste and price, price is key, convenience all matter. And we're, because of that, we're seeing this huge growth in ultra processed food and drink products. Not only are these, these products being pushed by, by private sector because they're, they're cheap to, to make, but um, they are a very tasty, cheap and, and convenient. And when we look across regions, blue are ultra processed drinks, green is ultra processed foods, we see a growth in, the, in this over time. And uh, more and more evidence is suggesting that these ultra processed foods are quite detrimental for for a variety of, of health outcomes. And we don't know the environmental impacts of these ultra processed foods. There's gonna be a paper coming out in the next couple of weeks showing the impacts, but we know that a lot of plastics are used in these foods with packaging. Um, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes from those studies. We need to learn from COVID. We have so many lessons stabilizing food systems, keeping trade flows open and flowing, supporting and protecting food system workers, particularly those at the very end of the supply chain who are delivering food or selling us food. They were undervalued, not protected during COVID and it's having significant ramifications now. We need to govern the regulation of illegal sales of wildlife and global food trade and food markets. It doesn't mean closing wet markets, but we certainly need to be thinking about uh, how food markets are, are moving zoonotic diseases around. We need to have social protection programs to help people afford healthy diets, particularly during the economic downturn that COVID is bringing and instituting a global effort to monitor pathogens emerging from animals with the One Health approach. So that's um, my summary. I'm really looking forward to questions and comments. And uh, thank you so much again for the invitation to be here. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fanzo, for that frankly sobering view. I think we knew a lot of that, in, um, but seeing it all together at once is, is really quite dramatic and, and sobering. Um, so we're going to take questions now. Um, there are two in the chat so far. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just read them off um, and um, have you answer them. If anybody wants to speak up, um, unmute and speak up, that's okay as well. So the first um, question comes from Alan Robach. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know of any work on how stratospheric geoengineering could reduce or increase the impacts of global warming on crops and food availability? I don't. <laughs> I can answer that very quickly. <laughs> and maybe Alan, you could explain what stratospheric geoengineering is because I'm not sure. <laughs> well, it's this scheme to emulate a volcanic eruption and put a cloud up in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight and cool earth. And it's... Wow. Uh, we're doing research on it and we're looking at impacts on food using crop modeling. And I was just wondering if you know of anybody else that's doing that. We're running global climate models to simulate the future climate based on different SSPs and then also with geoengineering and 
coupling that to food modeling. It sounds incredibly fascinating. I'd love to learn more, but I don't know. It sounds really interesting. Well, it's probably not a good idea, but we're trying. <laughs> but if you keep the temperatures from going up and you increase carbon dioxide, a lot of plants like that. But the question is, what would be the impacts? Would it change the summer monsoon precipitations? That's Anyway, that's the mm -hmm. things we're working on. Really interesting. All right. Thank you for that question. Um, is, is Judy Storch, uh, do you, would you like to ask your question directly? She's still here, I'm not seeing her. Um, all right, so I'll ask it for her. Yeah, well, I see it, yeah. yeah. The more data move our leaders. It has not done so for climate. Well, that's, it's a good question, Judith. I think it has for climate, um, you know, the, the IPCC is a science policy interface body that has been um, producing these very kind of doomsday science reports on what's happening with climate and what are the drivers of climate change and the consequences. And I do think it has moved the needle. One of the very- Very slightly. <laughs> very slightly well, compared to where it Well, I mean, we go. did come to the, we, we, we did, I, I think, Almost every country has been shaped by the data, ex with the exception of the United States, who some argue in this country that climate change is not human induced. Because if you admit that, well, that means you have to change. You have to change human behavior. But if you go to Europe or you go to Africa or you go to Asia, most countries feel climate change is, is very real. And I think the data has informed that. Um, in my experience working with food systems data, um, I think that some statistics can be quite powerful. Um, I think it can help, but I don't think, I think it's only part of it. You still need to have political will, political commitment, investments, you know, deal with those power asymmetries. So I think data is one piece of it, but it certainly helps inform decision makers of the dire issues that they're contending with. I think- yeah, I, didn't mean, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to make it sound like it had absolutely no impact, but the scale of the problem is so huge and the time frame is so small. So that's mm. what, that's my, you know, I'm just thinking what you asked the question, where should we be investing our energy and our political capital, intellectual capital. And I'm just wondering what we should be doing. And should we, as an academy, undergo some sort of radical change ourselves? That's all. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really important question. But, you know, research can really can shape policy. We've seen lots of examples of that. Um, research evidence can can create wholesale changes, and I think I I think for those those of us who don't want to go into politics, <laughs> I'm with you, <laughs> or go in the UN, um, you know, I think evidence and data. I think that's a really important message that we need to keep generating that and keep pushing it out. But we do as the research community need to be better at communicating our science and our evidence and data. We need to be much better at um, taking very highly technical concepts and, and bringing them down to the level that, you know, the policymaker who has five minutes to really understand what the problem is, understand it. So um, I think we need to get better at, at, at that communication piece. And in the nutrition world, as many of you know, Journalists have become the ones communicating the nutrition science for better or worse. Look at Michael Pollan, omnivore. Oh, you know, he, whether we agree with all of everything he writes in that book, I certainly don't have a number one New York Times selling book. <laughs> <laughs> so what yeah. went wrong? Why can't, why can't we as researchers communicate that way? And that's, yeah, I think that's, no. just, yeah. That's a, Super important point. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
All right, so we have a, another question uh, from Emily Hanselman, and then we'll go to Deb Palmer, who has her hand raised, and then we'll go to Zenya Morin, who has a question in the chat. So Emily, do you wanna speak up and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that very interesting talk. Um, I, you had showed a slide uh, that many thousands of years ago, the earth was similarly hot, and I was just curious about what we know about the variety of, of the plants, the edible plants that thrived at that time. If uh, we can learn anything from the history there, maybe fossil record or something. And can we promote these like ancient species of foods um, as crops now to, as like a part, just a piece of the solution? I, I assume they would need less water to grow. Um, just curious if that's something to think about. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think um, I don't know much about his, his history, and you know, I'm not a plant biologist. Um, but you know, when we look historically, um, and a lot of this work was done by uh, colleagues at SEAT and Bioversity, and they, and and many of the CGIAR, the Consultative Group for International Agriculture Research, which tries to populate these seed banks around the world, including the Svalbard one, the one up in the, the Nordic areas to try to create the apocalyptic vault. Um, you know, they, they calculate somewhere um, in the order of about 400,000 uh, plant species have been identified. And of that, about 5,500 can be used uh, as food for to, for human consumption throughout history, but you know, so there's some interesting work showing that the agriculture systems have become very homogenized, right? And about 75 percent of 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 the landscapes grow 12 crops now. So you could imagine that sort of trend has really wiped out a lot of the traditional neglected underutilized species around the planet. So there's a big push to try to not only save those seeds and plants, um, but to promote them in, in many cultures. And so there's been a lot of work by a few different organizations to try to bring back some of these traditional foods that have certain properties, whether they be more nutrient dense or they're wind tolerant or drought tolerant or you know able to stand flooding and so there's a, there's a real push to try to diversify uh, those landscapes um but you know if you look at the the cgiar system and what is funded it's mainly maize rice and and wheat and and that's the predominant and bill gates you know has has his their agriculture sector has funded a lot of that and that was born sort of out of the green revolution so there's a real need to try to bring back some of these traditional foods and and a lot of that is related to indigenous people's knowledge you know they've got a lot of that knowledge and if that's not used you know it's if you don't use it you lose it so yeah but it's a great it's a great uh, comment and question thank you thank you for the interesting talk Okay, uh, Deb Palmer. Well, I think we could agree after the last several years that the political machine uh, tends to work far more strongly in favor of constituents than it does in terms of uh, what scientists believe. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're looking at these issues of sustainability, I feel like we're talking to ourselves. I think, it's a, I think sustainability is a very uh, elitist concept because mm -hmm. I, teach an undergrad uh, elective course and I go over it and my students are shocked. They've never heard of it. No one mm -hmm. has ever said anything to them before and they're shocked at the concept and what actually matters to them. They're shocked at the concept that their children and grandchildren may have to confront food security and water security issues. They're totally shocked. I yeah. work in a low income program and we have been working with our staff. They had no idea. They had absolutely no idea. So when I speak to people who are highly educated and people who are scientists, you know, and people who know what's going on at international conferences, you know, you get this, you get the kinds of things you're talking about. We, we know this is happening, but the vast majority of Americans, I don't believe even know this is an issue. And 
I'm wondering, you know, I've certainly read your the reports that have been done. Um, you know, Jeb and I just worked on a paper on this, but I was wondering, do you know any efforts to start teaching kids in elementary schools and high schools and and the common person that these issues exist? Yeah, such a great question. I mean, I, I think I think probably less so around food, more so around climate. And I think there's a lot of young school age children that are becoming very aware of climate change. Um, I think it's very daunting for young people, very depressing. <laughs> you know, I agree. I, and my yeah. undergrads know that, but they yeah. have no idea the connection to food or water. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think food is still is still not really prioritized. I mean, I, I completely agree with you, Deborah. I don't you hear about programs, you know, the edible school gardens, let's say in the United States, or um, you know, the 4-H clubs in some parts of the country and land grant universities. Um, it's obviously much more forefront the issues of food in communities that are farming communities. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa where there's still 70% of people are rural farmers, they do think about food all the time. Um, but uh, I think food hasn't been completely central to the conversations in, in the United States education system. I mean, just look at the school meals program. There's a real disconnect even, I think all of you have probably been to do, to a nutrition conference even. We're talking to each other and you go to a nutrition conference and you walk out to go get, to go get a coffee and there's junk food out there. Like there's just, a, there seems to be this disconnect when it comes time to food and, and how we talk about it and how um, it's integrated into school programs. I think there's a lot of interesting pilot work going on, but nothing at scale um, to really uh, get uh, to educate young people around food and particularly food and climate. And just, I mean, from my perspective, Deborah, of being kind of in the food and climate field for a while now, again, the research is very contentious depending on what you're talking about. I didn't really, I do a whole talk on some of the contentious issues in, in the food system world. Livestock is one of the biggest ones. If you wanna start a fight on Twitter, do hashtag animal source foods. <laughs> you will get in. I mean, I was on the Eat Lancet Commission. We were getting death threats for that report. And every time I talk about it in a public forum on a t you know, TV show or something, I'll get a whole new slew of emails, totally death threat kind of stuff every time. Um, I published an article in Bloomberg, Mag uh, Bloomberg uh, News about meat consumption. And uh, I did it with a student of mine and we were getting death threats and Bloomberg had to kind of news had to intervene. And yeah, so... There's a real, you know, these issues are, are not well sorted out in the science community either around sustainability and what's a sustainable diet and what's a sustainable food system. So if we can't sort ourselves out, it becomes very hard to then uh, teach that at, at a, at, to, to younger children in, in my view. Like I, I feel the science is still very much emerging in this space. Um, so that adds another complexity to it. So we were Am getting... I depressing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, we have about five or so more minutes in our time allotted here. And so we have three questions. So if we could have um, maybe uh, Zenya ask your question really quickly and we'll get a quick re response so we can get the other two questions in too. Mm. Uh, hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for all you're doing to uh, expand the conversation. Um, my question is this, data costs money. And mm. I love that you and your colleagues have uh, put out a call to collect more data, bring it together. Question is, can we afford this? And how can we afford um, collecting all that data and making it efficiently and effectively shared without worrying about publications and peer review that takes a whole bunch of time? 
Yeah, great question. That's why I think we need, um, you're right. That's why I think we need partners like FAO, the Food and Ag Organization, which does have a lot of funding behind it you know, from member states every year to function. And they are really the keepers of the world's data on food. Now, could they improve their data sources? Yes, and they are making a big effort to do that. And they have someone named Maximo Torero, who's their chief economist, who's been quite amazing at trying to update their data. You need, that's why we need partners like FAO who think of data as a common good. It's shared across the world. They don't care about publications, right? They're just putting out data as fast as they can. Um, so to me that having partners like that is really key to the data piece. Um, and people look to WHO and FAO for data um, and, and, and they go through a lot of rigorous uh, you know, peer review processes to get their data out there. But so to me, that's kind of a key piece, but you know, there's a real underinvestment in data overall. Um, especially data that's open access. Um, we, and we're, we're hoping to push for that, but um, yeah, it's way, unfortunately the way we all have to operate is through publishing, right? For, to get tenure and things like that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an issue. Yeah, our world and data, great. Isn't that great? They're, they're, they're a competitor to us, but yeah, they always put out stuff faster than we can. But they, they too are relying on, a whole breadth of scientists to, to give them data. Um, but what a public good that's been, the our world and data. Yeah, it's pretty amazing out of Oxford. All right, um, so the next question is from Connie Pascal. Is Connie mm -hmm. still on the call? I am, but I do have to dive off to teach a class here in a couple of minutes, but okay. um, fascinating, sobering, inspiring. I might actually quit eating meat. I've been thinking about it for a while. Anyway, but uh, I grew up in the Midwest around uh, mono farming, vast mm -hmm. fields of corn and soybean. Ha and uh, I understand that that area quite well. What messaging works? Do we know what works? What will help with getting those types of farmers to um, change change into more sustainable practices or crops? Yeah, I mean, the, the issue for, for a lot of the farmers in the United States is they're very reliant on agriculture subsidies. Um, and so that makes it incredibly difficult for them to shift towards you know, crops that are not supported by subsidies. But there is this big effort right now and push to reorient agriculture subsidies towards more nutritious crops like horticulture, particularly in places where it's viable to grow horticulture. Um, but the, the stacks are a bit against you if you're a farmer in the Midwest and you're growing corn and soy and that's what's subsidized. Um, so shifting those subsidy policies is, is a, a of just a huge undertaking. And it's risky for farmers to go into what, you know, often the Midwest farmers call them like boutique crops, like to shift to tomatoes requires them to hire hand pickers, usually immigrants. They got to deal with immigration laws of the United States. They end up losing a lot of those crops because they're not perfectly shaped. You know, so it's, it's a real cost for, for, for US Midwest farmers to make shifts at the moment, but they're deeply worried about sustainability issues. You know, what Nebraska has been really struggling to make ends meet, for example, floods and droughts and floods and droughts. And, um, you know, the, the, the less diverse you are, the riskier it is. So they're really constrained. Um, and so I think a lot of people just get out of farming is how it's ended up happening. They're, they're leaving farming because it's just too difficult. So it begs the question of who, who, who will feed the world when we're urbanizing and people are leaving farming and the average age is 62. So we really need some breakthrough transformations in food systems, better technologies, 
all of that. Yeah, I see Connie's. Okay, so we have one final quick question. If Diane French would like to uh, speak up. That was just more of a comment than a question because I just happened to see it trending on Twitter this morning oh, about the menu. <laughs> Having six, they, they put all the uh, um, listings for the carbon footprint, but still had a huge amount. And I was like, maybe they're doing a study. <laughs> I saw that too. Yeah, a lot of meat on the menu at COP, which is just showing you this disconnect around food. Um, I mean, I think, that, yeah, it would be interesting to, well, you know, there was a bit of a debate about what, what's the quality of that meat and where is it coming from? You know, there, of course, here we go. You get into this debate with entire, start talking about animal source foods. People are like, well, maybe it's, you know, the meat is from grass fed beef and, you know, yeah. kind of quickly get into these contentious arguments, but yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay, folks, um, I'm gonna have to uh, end it here, but I have a couple orders of business before we go. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fanzo, for a wonderful talk and wonderful uh, discussion. I just wanna show you, uh, hopefully you can see it, uh, this plaque commemorating your um, uh, lecture today will be sent to you at an appropriate time when you're back in the United States, I gather, and so Christina will take care of that. And then very, very quickly before we go, um, I just want to share my screen real quick. Um, and I want to uh, uh, have some thank yous, uh, not only to Dr. Fanzo, but to Christina Duffy, who arranged everything today, did a wonderful job there. Uh, the Department of Nutritional Sciences Seminar Committee chaired by Tracy Anthony. Um, and then also to note that um, this, uh, presentation was done in coordination with the Rutgers University Center for Agricultural Food Ecosystems or the RU Cafe, which is a part of our Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health. Uh, so with that, um, I think we will wrap up and thank Dr. Fanzo one more time. Can't hear all the clapping, you can see some of the clapping um, and that's, um, that's it for today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So Dr. Fanzo, you'll be meeting with the grad students. Um, Andre Smith. Hello. Hi. Hi. So yeah, uh, the graduate students, if you'd like to hang around and um, have a discussion with Dr. Fanzo, we'll be here for a little bit. All right, so Dr. Fonzo, that's my cue to exit as well. This is just for the graduate students. So um, enjoy your conversation with them and thank you once again, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Josh. Thank Good you. Thank you. Okay. All right, I think it, it's us now. Good. Well, so thank you so much for, for meeting with us. I think, um, I mean, yeah, clearly it got a lot of people talking and uh, very important stuff. Um, so I just want to open it up to anybody. Um, any general questions for Dr. Fonza? That's really exciting. Um, thank you for the talk. I, I had a, a, some follow-up questions too, actually. I was, I was curious about Maybe what, Emily, tell tell me what you're studying oh. and and like where. Are oh you? yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so um, I'm a graduate student in Dr. Paul Breslin's lab in sensory science and nutrition and and how taste, um, and the biology of taste and also metabolism kind of co coincide. Hmm. Um, and so I'm really interested in in your talk also about food choices and. Um, how, you know, taste plays a role you were mentioning and all of that as well. Um, and I'm curious too about the, the food waste, um, that side of things, and also the like plant-based uh, foods and taste related to, to that. Um, so yeah, my, one of my questions was just about food waste. Um, I was curious if, if I could just ask you an extra question on what you think that would maybe look like. Um, if it would mean like smaller trips to the grocery store, like a, a culture of that, or if it would mean more of the food industry or, or, or growing uh, crops or the location or transport of things. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Was, I found that was interesting part of it. Yeah, food waste is because there's food loss and then food waste, right? Loss is what's being lost at the farm gate or along the supply chain. And then food waste is more at the retail and household level. Thinking about food waste, um, there's a lot of programs in Europe right now um, where they provide discounted uh, ugly fruits or vegetables or the imperfect. We've got the imperfect foods. I think that's in the U.S. too. Um, and they're sold at a discount or free or free at the end of the day. And you have like an app and you can go and pick up those foods. Um, but, you know, the imperfect foods actually delivers these imperfect foods right to your door. There's also the issue of um, sell-by versus use-by dates. There's two dates. 